Hello, this is Josh Patel, again back with another biology video. Today we're going to do chapter 14, which is interactions in ecosystems. And we'll start at 14.1, which is habitat and niche. Our key concept is every organism has a habitat and a niche. Habitats differ from niches, so a habitat is all aspects of the area in which an organism lives, so everything. It can be biotic factor and abiotic factors. An ecological niche includes all of the factors that a species needs to survive and stay healthy. So a niche is basically what it needs to stay alive. So food, water, abiotic conditions like the weather or behavior. So resource availability gives structure to a community. So, as we know, a community needs resources to survive. Species can share habitats and resources with other species. So, cats and dogs, or let's give a realer example, like birds in a rainforest also live with other predators like tigers. Competition occurs when two species use resources in the same way. Competition exclusion keeps two species from occupying the same niche. Competition occurs when either it can be two species or two organisms of the same species. They compete for different resources. So like in the desert, species probably compete for the little water they have. Com competitive exclusion has different outcomes. One species is better suited to a niche than another, and then the other will either be pushed out or become extinct. So, or the niche could be divided. The two species will further diverge. So if there's a thing that both of them want, so it's part of their niche, these species will compete for it and try to gain, o gain it. And if one species is better at getting it, the other one will probably end up being extinct or the population will diminish. So here we can see bees and butterflies are both going to the flowers as their niche because they need it to survive. Ecological equivalents are species that occupy similar niches but live in different geographic areas. So these are both types of frogs, so they live in the same habitat, have the same niche, but they live in different areas. One lives in Madagascar all the way on the coast of Africa, and one lives in South America. So 14.2, community interactions. Organisms interact as individu in individuals and as populations. So competition and predation are two important ways in which organisms interact. Competition occurs when two organisms fight for the same limited resource. So these limited resources help them survive and so they'll compete against it because they really need it. There is intraspecific competition and interspecific competition. Those aren't really that important. So predation occurs when one organism captures and eats another. So it's basically the organism eats the other one for food and it hunts it. So there are three major types of symbiotic relationships. So we probably did these before in maybe middle school, eighth grade. So we have mutualism, which is both organisms benefit, so both of them are happy. So here we have a bat eating a seed or something from a cactus. So the bat gets food, it's happy, and the cactus gets its seed spread out so it can, re it can reproduce, so the cactus is also happy. Then we have commensalism, which one organism benefits and the other is unharmed. So we have a human, so our eyelashes are home to tiny mites that feast on oil secretion and dead skin without harming us. Up to 20 mites be living in one eyelash focal foci. So we have the insects that live in there, so Eyelash mites find all they need to survive in the tiny follicles of eyelashes. Magnified here 225 times, these creatures measure 0.4 millimeters in length and can be seen only with microscopes. So these mites are living in our eyelashes, and they're not affecting us, but they're benefiting from getting all the oil secretion and dead skin. But we don't really, it's, it's not harming us. Then we have parasitism, one organism benefits, but the other is harmed. So we have this caterpillar and we have a braconid wasp. So the host hornworm will eventually die as 
its organs are consumed by wasp larvae. So, brachnid larvae feed on their host and release themselves only shortly before reaching the pupa stage of development. So, th this larva is basically just feasting on the caterpillar. And there's other forms of parasitism, like maybe tapeworm, where this, the tapeworm lives inside a host body and sucks up all the nutrients, basically. So, parasitism meets their needs as you... Well, this slide isn't very important anyway. So, 14.3 population density and distribution. Key concept here is each population has a density, a dispersion, and a reproductive strategy. Population density is the number of individuals that live in a defined area. So, population density is a measurement of the number of individuals living in a defined space. So, it's basically the number of people per area. We can calculate this by number of individuals over the area, and this is our population density. Geographic dispersion of a population shows how much individuals in a population are spaced out. Population dispersion refers to how a population is spread in the area. So here we have clump dispersion, where the populations are clumped into little groups. Uniform dispersion, while well, they're in uniform straight lines, they're evenly spaced apart. And random dispersion is just random. So those are the three types of dispersion. So this is an example of clump dispersion. All the fish, how they swim in schools. A uniform dispersion are these birds with their nest uniformly spaced out. And then we have random dispersion, like I guess sloths. They're not. They don't really come in contact with other sloths. They're just randomly spaced out. Survivorship curves help to describe the reproductive strategy of a species. Survivorship curve is a diagram showing the number of surviving members over time from a measure of set birth. So it's basically how many births there are and then how many survive and when they die off. So that's what a survival survivorship curve is. So this is an example one. It gives the average years and that's when they die. And so it basically shows the species reproductive strategy. So there are a couple strategies. So it can be one, two, or three type. So type one is low level of infant mortality and an older population. So this is like humans and other mam other large mammals that give live births. So type two, the survival ship rate is equal at stage all stage of stages of life. So you have an equal chance of dying at any stage, basically. So it's common to birds and reptiles. And type three is very high birth rates very high infant mortality, so many things are born and many things will die. This is common to invertebrates and plants. So type 1 would be like humans, so we give live births and we only have one or two kids, and so we want to keep them safe so they don't die as often. And then type 2 is kind of has a little more kids, but they're still try to be protected, but they just have a lot of things they can die to, and then type 3 is when fishes and stuff have like thousands of eggs at once, and they hatch thousands of kids, and then half of them, no, like more than half of them die off in the first couple of weeks, so we have high infant mortality. So these are the curves, and it's just showing basically what we said. So population and growth patterns. Plants grow in predictable patterns. Populations grow in predictable patterns. Changes in population size are determined by immigration, births, immigration, and deaths. So these are the four ways our population can change. So, it's just the same thing. So, okay. There's a difference between immigration and emigration. Immigration is coming into the population, like in is, you could think of it as in. And then emigration is like exit, so it's things exiting the population. Population growth is based on available resources. So exponential growth is a rapid population increase due to an abundance of resources. So as we know, resources is directly related to how big our population is. So if we have, if we suddenly get more resources, we're probably going to have a population boom. So if you get more water in the desert, more things are going to be able to drink it and survive and pass on more young so we have a population boom. Logistic growth is due to a population facing limited resources. 
So this is an image of a logistic growth curve. This is a very important curve to know. So basically the population keeps growing until it reaches its carrying capacity. And the carrying capacity is a line on the graph that basically shows how much the resources in the area can, like how many people it can supply. So carrying capacity is the maximum number of individuals in a population that the environment can support. So the environment cannot support anything more than the carrying capacity. So a population crash is a dramatic decline in the size of a population over a short period. So after they reach the carrying capacity, a lot of them are going to die off because the environment can't support that many people. So event, um, examples of population crashes would be like right here. It happened in just a month and right here, which happened in about three months. So a very short, dramatic crash. Ecological factors limit population growth. A limiting factor is something that keeps the size of a population down, so it keeps it low. Density-dependent limiting factors are affected by the number of individuals in a given area. So depending on how many people are, people there are, this is the limiting factor that's affected by it. So density-dependent limiting factors are affected by the number of individuals in a given area. So the limiting factors change depending on how many people there are. So predation, if there's more prey, the predators will eat them easier. And then there's competition, parasitism, and disease. So competition we know is them fighting for the same resources. So if there's more people, there's going to be more competition because they're going to have to share among a bigger group. If there's less people, there's going to be less, less competition because they don't really have to fight that much for their food. Everybody can have some. And then this is another good thing to notice because they're probably going to ask questions about this. On these graphs that they show a prey and a predator, there is a trend here. So as one goes up, the other one must be down. So, okay, the orange is moose and the blue is wolf. So in the beginning here, the wolf is higher, so the moose has to be a little lower, but it doesn't show that much here. But as you see here, right here, the wolf population starts to decline, and right here, this is the bottom peak of its decline. And when it's down, the moose population went up, so there's less wolves to feed, like, to attack the moose. So since there's less moose dying, more moose form. So we have lots of moose. And then once we have a lots of moose, the wolves find out that there are many wolves to pick from to kill, and so they'll probably they'll kill more moose. So the moose population will decline again, and since the wolves can kill more moose, there's going to be more wolves, and they'll go up. And then there's more wolves, but less moose, so the wolves don't have that many moose to eat, so they're going to start dying from starvation. And then the moose are going to peak up too, because there's no wolves to kill them, so it just keeps going on and on. And it's kind of like, an ev it can kind of be like the same thing with evolution. One thing evolves, then the other evolves. So the prey evolves, the predator evolves, prey evolves, predator evolves to counterbalance each other. So density independent limiting factors limit a population's growth regardless of density. Unusual weather, natural disaster, human activities. So these three things are, they don't have to relate to how many people there are. There can always be a natural disaster. And there will always be unusual weather. This doesn't, it's, the weather doesn't go, oh, there's 50 people there, I'm going to choose rain. It just, it's random. And then human activities, we don't really care how many animals there are there, we just do what we want to do. And it causes disasters. So, ecological succession. Ecological succession is a process of change in the species that makes up a community. So, succession is basically remaking a community or starting one succession occurs following a disturbance in an ecosystem so once an ecosystem burns or dies there's succession to rebuild it succession regenerates to, or creates a community after a disturbance a sequence of biotic changes damaged communities are regenerated and new communities arise in previously uninhabited areas so basically after like a lava spill here, the community will eventually regrow.
So there are two types of succession. There's primary and secondary. So primary succession is started by pioneer species. So these are just pioneer species are basically just new out of the blue species. They just come. They're not they weren't there before. So this chart here or this image here is supposed to show the soil is all rocky and bad and nothing was able nothing was there before. And so these pioneer species, these little bushes and trees here just came from seeds from somewhere and they started to grow and they created a nice forest here. And then the glacier is to show that once the glacier washes away the rocks and sediment below, there, can't, there couldn't have been anything growing there, but eventually a forest might appear over a couple thousand years. So secondary succession started by remaining species, so after a natural disaster or something. So here there might have been a forest fire or something that burned all the plants, but there was still some living. So then they regrow and come back up. And here is the forest fire. And then obviously not all the trees are going to burn to death. There's still going to be some living. And those trees are going to reproduce at the end and start a new life, a new forest. So that's the end of chapter 14, which is interactions in the ecosystem. And next time we will be doing chapter 15.